Welcome back, my YouTube friends. I'm Gene Delasala, president of Audioholics, and today we have... Hugo Rivera, vice president of marketing. How are you, Gene? Hugo, I'm doing great. Had some good food, pumped up to do some videos. Likewise. Well, I'll tell you what, let's talk about subwoofers today. You know, that's a great topic. Oh, always it always is, that. of course. And you know, a lot of people are thinking that one sub is all you need, but we know a little bit better than that, no? Some people don't even think you need a sub. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You're right. I think today we should talk about the value of considering having more than one sub. And if you have the two subs in your room, you know, for what rooms is best and uh, what kind of room correction you can go ahead and do and how to position them. It's a great topic. And of course, I'm sure it'll get a big response and we'll probably do even more videos on this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, um, we got to first step back for a minute and define large room and small room, okay? Mm -hmm none of us have large rooms unless you're Donald Trump or, or right. someone like that okay large rooms I'm talking about like cineplexes or, or auditoriums right. rooms that are much bigger than the base wave wavelengths mm -hmm. okay I'm talking about rooms that are hundreds of feet by hundreds of feet most home theater rooms are considered small rooms now small rooms are great for getting good sound above the room transition frequency a couple hundred Hertz but they're very difficult and challenging to get good bass from mm -hmm. seat to seat. You know, back in the day, it used to be you set up a, for a single sweet spot for stereo. You didn't really care. You got good bass at that seat, but every other every other seat in that room would suffer. Right. But most people didn't set up for multiple seats. So the same problem exists when you use only one subwoofer. One subwoofer can give you great results in a very narrow area, like one or two, maybe a couple of seats. Maybe in one, if you have a multi-row, maybe it'll give you good bass in the first row, not so much in the second row. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is you're dealing with a problem called standing waves, which are also known as room modes. So, you know, standing waves are low frequency resonances that take place between two parallel reflecting wall surfaces. They result from an interaction of wavelengths and distances between the surfaces. So they're basically a result of sound waves bouncing off of two parallel adjacent walls at multiples of one half the wavelength that the resonances are formed. So if you've got, a, let's say you've got a 20 foot long room, you'll experience your first modal resonance at around 2800, uh, 28 hertz, okay? Now, how are we gonna combat these, these resonances? Mm -hmm. The best way, and this is, we gotta give credit to the guys at Harmon, you know, guys like Absolutely. Dr. F Guys like Dr. Floyd Toole and, and Todd Welty, it's their credit that they've actually studied the science of room modes and they've documented everything down and where to put your subs and, and how, to, how to deal with this. Because years ago, um, it was a lot of guesswork mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people were using bass traps, very big and bulky bass yes. traps and lossy bass traps mm -hmm. to try to get better sound in a room. And as you know, when you start getting into the bass frequencies, you need big acoustic absorbers. They're big, they're bulky, they're inefficient, they, they turn uh, bass waves into heat. Yep. So you're losing efficiency, you're losing dynamic range of your, of your headroom of your sound. Now, I'm not saying you don't need any type of acoustic treatments at all, but you really negate the need and you lower the need for using these type of treatments if you employ multiple subs properly positioned in your room properly playing the same signal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of benefit to that. And if you're in a rectangular room or a square room, a, a room that has symmetry both in length and width, it's very easy to predict where to put these subs because we know where the room modes are going to form. It's an ideal condition. It's an ideal condition. Now, in my room, unfortunately, we have an L-shaped room. All bets are off. Yeah. I can't use room mode calculators. I can't use even the Harman stuff that they have uh, to predict the room modes and all that stuff. I can't use any of that software. Not even Steve Hawken would, would attempt the math that's involved in trying to figure these room modes out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so in, that, in those situations, you're going to need to get more creative. You're going to need to have a measurement system, preferably something that has at least 1 12th octave resolution. The problem I see a lot, and you go on these internet forums, they use they use these um, measurement systems, like even like some of the built-in auto EQ. Oh yeah. It's got like one third or one octave resolution. Mm -hmm. That's useless. It's a toy. It really you need is. at least one twelfth octave resolution to to get the right kind of measurements, so you know how to deal with the frequency problems you're getting mm -hmm. for the bass waves. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about if you're in a let's just assume you're in a rectangular room for the moment. Right. Uh, there's very established criteria of where to place these multiple subs. And according to the researcher Harmon, 
uh, two subs is almost as good as four. Which is interesting. Most people think four will be better. Four is better if you could do it. It's but it costs you money and it sure. costs you floor space. But yeah, two will get you there pretty close. And the best way to put two subs in a rectangular room is one up at the front mid wall, one at the back mid wall. Now you could also do the left and right side mid walls, but you don't get as much efficiency doing that. Okay. Now another option would be if you put both subs up front. You could corner load both subs, but you probably want to pull them out about a quarter of the length of the wall on each side. You probably get better results by mm -hmm. doing that. Um, some people have done diagonal placed on opposite walls. You don't get quite as good uh, seat to seat consistency. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that it's not ideal for people to always put it in the best locations. So you got to kind of experiment sometimes, but as close as you can get to the best locations, will minimize your effort when you have to come to integrate in the subs, whether you're using EQ or you're having to you know, adjust the delays and stuff like that. It's better to get the positional placement uh, optimized. The other thing you can manipulate is, I call this positional EQ. It's you move the seats to the better base measurements. You move the seats forward a little bit. You want it to generally, you want to keep the seats off the back wall, about a one quarter length of the room width, uh, of the room. And you know, if you've got bad seats, that's where you put the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> you can always repurpose those, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there you go for two subs. If you got four subs, you know, the, the common belief a few years ago was put four subs on mid walls, on each mid wall. And that does give you the best seat to seat consistency for every, for every chair in your room. But it also is the least efficient. You could put four of these subs mid wall, identical subs, and have almost less output than having that one sub placed in the corner. Incredible. So I really don't like the four mid wall subs. I've heard a lot of demo rooms at Cedia and at some professional organizations where they've done the four mid wall sub placement. It just sounded weak to me. I mean, the base was even and everything, but it wasn't a lot of tactile. It's just not something that I would recommend. I would recommend instead putting four corner loaded mm -hmm. on each corner of your room. Corner load the subs. You get all the maximum gain by having the, the subs in eighth space, which is having the three parallel surfaces right. and corner loading the sub. You'll get you'll be exciting all the room modes, so you'll get pretty good seat to seat consistency. And if you have a big hump, realize this. If you apply global EQ to all the subs at once instead of EQ in each one separately, to get rid of that bump. Speakers are minimum phase devices. Mm -hmm. You take that energy out of the room by EQing it, you'll take it out for every seat. EQ will get rid of these room resonances, but it won't fix your seat to seat variance. Okay, Understood. that's a common myth. A lot of these auto room correction systems, oh, they'll, they'll promise you the moon, but they'll give you cheese. <laughs> We're used to that in this industry. Yeah. <laughs> they can take out the bumps and stuff, but they're not going to fix seat to seat consistency. If you have a huge suck out at one seat, no EQ system is going to fix it for that one seat and not mess it up somewhere else. In fact, I think you have really good measurements and data to prove that. I've got a ton of data. I've been measuring this room for like seven years, yeah, man. Know. I've been moving my subs around. It, to this day, you still second guess yourself. You know, you're constantly measuring. I do because I'm not in a predictable room. It kill. It's my Achilles heel. <laughs> I can't do the MATLAB on it. I can't do simulations on it. And the only thing I can rely on is trial and error with measurements. And I'm still chasing my tail because I don't have a system. There's very few solutions on the market. Harman has one solution. It's called Soundfield Management. They'll actually measure each sub they'll set the delays and they'll set the channel trims first and then it'll apply an, uh, an EQ. No matter where you put the subs, it'll find you the best configurations for the subs. I wish was, this was uh, available for the consumer market. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, Harman products like their receivers, they don't have it. You got to go to JBL Synthesis to get this kind of technology or even get the Revel subwoofer line, which has some of this technology built in. Now, you know, Odyssey does some of it. They do try to adjust the delays and they do adjust the channel trims. But the problem with a lot of these EQ systems is they try to make everything flat. And what the research has shown is you don't want flat bass, you want even bass, but you want a gradual rise as frequency goes down because we prefer to have a little boost. Mm -hmm. We just don't want it to go like a... Yeah, we don't want it to oscillate. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You don't want to have big nulls and big, and big peaks. You want consistent linear bass, but you want a gradual rise in bass at low frequencies. A lot of guys don't get that. 
and you wind up, you press the audio EQ switch and you got you may have a better measurement, but it may not sound better. It might sound too thin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just have to rely on your ear too. You know, I think, I, I think a lot of people these days, what's happening, Gene, is that they're listening with the measurement. That's yeah. not listening. Yeah. You need to really listen to what's going on in the room. And then, you know, you use the measurements as what they are, a guideline. Not only that, but the measurements that these systems, these room correction systems like Odyssey, for example, and I, I'm not trying to single out Odyssey, but I have my most experience with Odyssey, and I've used Yamaha's Wipeout and the Pioneer uh, Mackie system. They'll show you a readout of before and after. <laughs> it has no representation of reality. It's an sure. ideal target. So a lot of people, they post these measurements, look what I got, I'm on the forums. Look what I got, I have a flat, a you could draw a line from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. This is what my <laughs> system is now. BS. <laughs> <laughs> it's like those before and afters that you see for fat burners, you know? Many oh, yeah. Time, many times they're heavily photoshopped, okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, of course. Or the Sky Mall with the 70 year old guy that's completely jacked because he did a treadmill. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? With some rubber bands. Yeah, that simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, guys, there's a lot of benefits to multiple subs. You you manipulate the room modes to get more consistent bass in your room so you have better seat to seat consistency you have more happy people in your theater room that's number one you gain some dynamic range by having multiple subs now people think every time you add a sub you add 6 db of dynamic range mm -hmm. that's only true if you co-locate the sub and you play the same signal okay there's no point in doing that because if you put both subs in the same location, you're not re manipulating the room modes any differently. Exactly. Yeah. So I really don't recommend that. Mm -hmm. I recommend getting a good sub, starting with one, adding a second one, strategically place it, and then when you set them up, make sure all your subs are playing the same signal. You want the mono output from your processor with the LFE plus all the speakers base managed set small going to that sub. You want every one of those subs playing the same signal. And ideally, if you've got a processor that has multiple sub outs and you could adjust the delay of each sub, there's some benefit to that. I know, uh, like I said, sound field management will do, it'll find the right delay for each sub. There's a myth saying that you don't need to worry about the delays, just send the same delayed signal to all the subs. That's not always the ideal situation here. I mean, I've, I've, I've been fight, fighting with receiver companies to give us multiple sub outputs with independent delays, and now they're starting to do it on the higher end models. There's benefit to that, especially at the primary sweet spot. How about getting different subs? Do you, do you recommend people get the same kind of uh, brand of sub and the exact same sub, or do you want to have instead uh, different types of subs? Generally speaking, it's best to get the same subs because you want to have the same output capabilities. You don't want to have one sub that's crapping out at 30 hertz when the other one's good down to 25 hertz. You want subs that have the same roll-off rate. And in my room, I don't practice what I preach you know. <laughs> I've got these giant status acoustic towers that are ported, which yes. have a 24 dB proctive roll off below tuning. Then I've got two Validine DD15 plus sealed subs, which have a 12 dB proctive roll off. And the problem is if I, if I leave them in that setting, I get all sorts of acoustic cancellations down at the tuning frequencies of my ported subs. So what did I do? I did a couple of tricks on my situation. I made my Validines look like ported subs by increasing the slope of the high pass filter. Nice. Okay, so I tricked it into making it look like it's a ported sub. So in generally, I don't recommend that because that takes you know some know-how, it takes some measurement capability. The easiest solution, stick with the same subs. If you can, get a theater room that's a predictable shape, a rectangle or a square. That way you know where the subs should go. The more variables that are known, the easier it is to set this stuff up. Yeah, that's the bottom line. Awesome. Well, with this subs, what you did is that you turned death into a fighting chance to live. Yes, again, the Kobayashi Maru. <laughs> Once again, what you always do, Jim, you turn death into a fighting chance <laughs> to love live. I love that. It's a classic. <laughs> so, yeah, guys, you know, we, I always recommend every theater system I install, whether it's my own or family or friends, whatever, I do at least two subs. Now, in a, in a regular shaped room, a rectangle or square, multiple subs are usually best in even numbers, two or four. Mm -hmm. But in a regular shaped room like mine, all bets are off. It could be the magic number, it could be three, it could be five. I mean, it's, you know, it really depends on your situation. But in generally speaking, in a predictable room, you want to stick with two or four subs. Awesome. Well, Gene, 
awesome video, I think. I think it will open a lot of eyes, to be quite honest. Let us you. know how many subs you're using and where you're placing them. You know, Hugo, yeah. throw up those pictures of our sub diagrams, follow our, our guidelines here. I know my, my drawings are a bit crude, but they're effective. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And That's if you've got a bad seat, put your mother-in-law in it. Trust me, she'll, it. she won't even know the difference. Won't at all. <laughs> Luckily, my mother-in-law doesn't speak much English. <laughs> Thank God. So she has no clue what I'm saying right now. <laughs> Love you, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. Awesome. Well, on that note, just let us know what you think. Uh, comment below and also click like on our video and share it with your friends. And feel free to subscribe to our channel so you get the videos on a weekly basis. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep, keep listening. listening.